We're in chapter 4C. You should check out chapters 4A and B. There are two parts to B. Okay. So we're winding down chapter 4 here, ladies and gentlemen. Still the summertime. Sweet, sweet summertime. So we got to look at element notations. And this is a way that we can write up information about atoms of different elements. Now the first thing we have to look at is the atomic number Z, which down here, the Z belongs here. Okay, the Z is our atomic number. It's the number of protons in the nucleus. So for carbon, for example, the Z number is six because it's got six protons. For hydrogen, the Z number would be one. For oxygen, the Z number would be eight. It all depends on how many protons there are in the nucleus of the atom because it's the identity. Now there is also the N number, which is the number of neutrons uh, in there. Okay, now sometimes there's a variation of the number of neutrons in there. We'll get to that a little later. The mass number is A, that's our mass number, is equal to Z plus N. So in other words, the number of protons and the number of neutrons added together. Do we worry about electrons here in terms of mass number? No. How come? I mean, they are a particle. Yeah, but they're so, so tiny, they weigh next to nothing. A proton and a neutron, they're massive compared to an electron. So we don't have to deal with that, okay? So when we look at a notation like this, X, we can represent that with a chemical symbol. So let's go with carbon. Let's just do carbon here for an example. So here's our element carbon. Well, what's our atomic number, our Z number for carbon? Well, it's six, okay? And if we assume that there's six neutrons and six protons, we can add them together, and we can have 12. So that's what we have, 12, six, and there's our carbon. Now, carbon also has its own weird thing, because you'd say, well, wait a minute, isn't there like other carbons out there? Yeah, there is actually, and we're gonna get into that, okay? Moving on here, so with that, we got to talk about isotopes. Isotopes are variations uh, in atoms. They're uh, variations within the same element, okay? So the only thing that makes the atom an isotope is the number of neutrons, because the number of protons have to stay the same, because if it doesn't stay the same, You've changed its identity. That's it. That's all you can do. It's like a Malibu Stacy with a new hat. That's a reference if you got it, plus one. That would be an isotope. You got regular Malibu Stacy and then Malibu Stacy with a new hat. That would be an example of an isotope. It's an analogy. So here's our carbon 12. Here's our 12, our atomic mass here. Six protons, six neutrons. That's our regular light carbon. Yay! Here we have carbon 13, where we have an atomic mass of 13. We've got six protons, seven neutrons. It's heavier, okay? There is a carbon 14. Now, carbon 14 is six protons, eight neutrons, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is carbon-14, which is used in radioactive carbon dating. Yeah, so that's kind of a big deal. Now here we have hydrogen. Hydrogen, usually, most of the time, hydrogen is just one proton, one electron, yay, and that's your typical hydrogen. But you can have deuterium, which you have one proton, one neutron, and one electron. Do they behave differently? No, not really, it's just, it's heavier. Again, it's like Malibu Stacy with a new hat, okay? That's just the way it is. All right, let's keep going here. So oxygen, let's take a look at oxygen here. So Z is eight, so it tells us it's got eight protons. The most common isotope is oxygen 16. So eight protons, eight neutrons. Remember, we don't worry about electrons here. So the isotopic notation is for oxygen 16 is 16 and eight. Eight is the number of protons. 16 is the number of protons and neutrons. Here's carbon-14. Six protons, typical, standard for carbon, and then you've got eight neutrons in there. So that's when you get the carbon-14. Those are the isotopes. 
Another way to look at it, you can have your regular Mustang car, okay? And then you have the Mustang GT with all the extras in there. Does it weigh more than the regular Mustang? Yeah, it does a little bit. Why? Because you have all that extra stuff. I mean, you tricked out the Mustang GT, yo! So that would be an isotope. The Mustang GT is an isotope of the Mustang. Think about it that way. Moving on. Atomic mass. Atomic mass units, or AMU. Abu! Okay. So one atomic mass unit is equal to 1 12th the mass of a carbon-12 atom. About the same mass as a proton or a neutron. Okay. Wait, you're losing me here. What's happening here? We had to pick a standard. Scientists had to pick a standard. How do we weigh all these atoms and how do we weigh all these elements? You know, where do we start? So we started with the regular carbon atom, the carbon-12 atom, and that's what we start with. Okay? Now, if you were to go and look at a periodic table, you'd sit there and you'd notice it's not whole numbers, not necessarily for many of them. It's not. Well, wait a minute. Why aren't we having whole numbers? Isn't, isn't it a question of the number of protons plus the number of neutrons, because electrons are too light? What gives? Well, let's take a look at chlorine, for example. Chlorine, if we look at it, there is a variation. You have chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. Now, chlorine has 17. Okay, so the reality is chlorine has 17. That's its normal thing. Okay, so you have chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. So for chlorine 35, that means there's 18 neutrons in there, 17 protons. And for chlorine 37, it's 20. So these are the two notations for chlorine 35 and 37. So we look at how common are they out there in the world, okay? And it says roughly about 76% to about 24% roughly. So when we add them up and we get an average, we get about 35.46 roughly or about 35.45, depending on who you talk to. So when we look at the periodic table, those numbers are not whole numbers because it allows all those isotope variations. How often do those isotopes happen? And this is all natural stuff. This is stuff that we find out in nature. Okay, keep going. So we got into isotopes. Now we're gonna move on. We're gonna talk about valence electrons a bit. And electrons are in the outermost energy level. These guys are key players. They typically occupy your highest numbered S and P orbitals. So if I look at here, K is short for potassium. Potassium, if I look here, normally it's going to have 19 electrons. It has 19 protons. We're going to say 19 electrons for it and say, OK, it's neutral. So we start filling out the different levels with the electrons here. And this is more like Bohr's model of the atom. But for what we're doing here, it's OK to use that. And we find, oh, look, there's one valence electron there in that outermost layer. And that would be a key thing there, because that would happen to be in 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s. Mm. Hmm. Double check here. One S. You got two S and two P. Then you got three S and three P here, and then you have four S. That's the correct way to look at it. Okay. So that's a fairly important thing there. So that's when we get into electron dot notation. Okay. So we're going to use dots to represent these valence electrons. You can have a minimum of zero, a minimum of one, maximum of eight. And you say, well, why are we bothering with these valence electrons? Who really cares? Because that's where the hookups are made between the atoms. That's what's going on. It's not, it's not the electrons down here that are going to do the hookups. Okay? They're sitting there going, woo! 
party, house music, bring down the house, yo, and that's it. These guys out here in the outer level, they're the ones that make things happen. They're the ones that cause those atoms to react, or maybe not react, but they control an awful lot. Those tiny little particles control many, many things. So we can look at electron dots here, and you may notice here, let's take a look at hydrogen here. Hydrogen's got one dot, because it's got one valence electron, right? It go boom, it is flammable, okay? You Led Zeppelin fans, you should know this about your uh, album cutter. Now, if we go over here, we got helium. Helium's got two. That's the maximum number of electrons that the helium atom will take. Okay, that's nice. But you don't hear about helium catching on fire. You don't hear about, you know, balloons blowing up, do you? No. Helium is a noble gas. It's really hard to get it to blow up. So you have all these different numbers of electrons there, and it causes the atoms to bond a certain way. So this is just giving you an idea. How is that arranged on the periodic table? Okay. With the valence electrons. And we're going to work on that in class. But we're going to go into ionized atoms. We, got, we need to wrap this up. Okay. So atoms will either stay neutral, which for most of them is unlikely that's going to happen. They will either drop electrons or pick up electrons, depending what they need. Okay? It's the idea that if you lose or gain any electrons, an atom is going to become positive charged or negative charged. So when we talk about an ion, an ion is an atom that has a charge. It's a charged atom. Now, it could be a cation or an anion. A cation is positively charged atom, like Na+. Okay? An anion is a negatively charged atom, like Cl-. I like to think positively. That's why I'm a cation. Okay? For years, I had a hard time trying to remember which way to do this. So, I'm going to show you guys. For a cation, I think about the kitty cat. I think cats like to scratch with their claws. Okay, so when you think about cats, it can claw like this and claw like this, like this. Okay, so that, so then of course you go like that. There's your cat eye on. Okay, boys and girls, I'm done here. We're through with chapter four, and the correct term is.